All right. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and ask our um, presenters today uh, to introduce themselves as well as um, Latham, who is here um, helping support with the slides. And um, in the chat, I will also be helping managing the chat. Um, as people go through, as, as our presenters kind of present the material, I, I want to encourage folks to please um, put any questions you have in the chat so we can uh, address those at the end. Um, I am going to go ahead and ask Christy and Sarah to introduce themselves. Sure. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I'm Christy Knight. I'm an advisor in the expenditure analysis branch in our strategic information evaluation and informatics division in USAID OHA. Thanks, Christy. Over to you, Sarah. And hi, my name is Sarah Ackerman. I'm a AAAS fellow, which is a scientist working in government, and I work on the health workforce branch. Thanks, Sarah. And Latham, can you introduce yourself too? Sure. Good morning, um, good afternoon, and, and everything in between. Uh, uh, my name is Latham Avery. I'm a data analyst with the local partner team here. Um, and I'll be supporting the team as they present. And we also have Selassie here um, from Tech Change just helping us uh, with the support. Um, okay, I know we still have people joining, and, and that's that is great. I know this is going to be a super popular session, um, but without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Christy uh, for um, the presentation. And again, just encourage folks to please put your questions in the chat and we will try to address them uh, after the presentations. Over to you, Christy. Great. Thanks, Callie. And Latham, if you can go ahead and advance um, a couple of slides to the objectives. Um, two more, I think. There we go. Thanks. Um, so as um, said in the introduction, I'm Christy Knight, and I'll be covering the first portion of our All Things Reporting and Data Updates agenda today. Um, we'll go through a review of PEPFAR data and data streams, including some specific to USAID, and how partners engage in all of the reporting processes. Then we'll cover the key changes and updates to some of these reporting streams, and I'll pass over to Sarah to provide information on the Human Resources for Health Inventory. So our HRH Inventory is the newest separate PEPFAR data reporting stream. And then, as noted, we'll have plenty of time for questions and put them in the chat box as we go, please. Next slide. First off, just a reminder that the latest version of the PEPFAR data calendar with FY22 dates is available now on the Datum Zen Desk. This is your go-to resource for all key reporting deadlines across all PEPFAR-wide data streams. Note that this will not include HFR or USAID's custom data specifically noted, um, since those are specific to USAID only, um, the custom dating data reporting cycle is aligned with the MER cycle. Next slide. There are four key routine data streams for PEPFAR and a number of supplemental data streams. On the programmatic side, the data stream most people are most familiar with is probably our monitoring, evaluation, and reporting, or MER data. This data includes our programmatic results, which are reported quarterly on the defined set of MER indicators and disaggregates. MER results are submitted by implementing partners for site level data through the DATUM platform and compiled there for review and analysis by agency, interagency, and SGAC. Um, partners can access MER data and analytics on the publicly available PEPFAR Panorama Spotlight website. The site includes both various data visualization dashboards and options to download various data sets. Also on the programmatic side, another key data stream is the Site Improvement Through Monitoring System, or SIMS data, our routine program quality metrics. Planning for SIMS data collection is done annually with quarterly updates submitted to SGAC by each USG interagency team. SIMS assessments are structured around core essential elements to help monitor and improve program quality at all PEPFAR supported sites. Um, USG staff or third-party contractors conduct site or above-site assessments with pre-notification to partners and then discuss the results and dashboard following any assessment for any follow-up remediation action. The next category of PEPFAR data is our, financial, is our program financial data. This encompasses three interrelated sets of data along the program cycle. 
all of the program financial data is organized around the PEPFAR financial framework, which is um, structured around interventions, which are combinations of program area and beneficiary. First is the budget data, which is planned by the interagency US government team in the FAST tool during the country operational plan or COP planning each spring. Next, implementing partner budgets by intervention are provided to partners following COP approval for implementing partners to develop work plan budgets, estimating cost category budgets by designated interventions. This occurs around the time of Q3 reporting and work plan budgets are also submitted via the data platform. And finally, at the end of COP, a COP implementation year, um, implementing partners report annual expenditures by intervention and cost category. This reporting occurs at the end of Q4, is also submitted in datum and um, is done via the ER specific template. And then the newest data, um, PEFAR data reporting requirement is the HRH inventory. This involves annual reporting by implementing partners of the full staffing and HRH footprint and expenditures. It's also submitted in datum and Sarah will provide a lot of additional information and detail on the HRH inventory in just a few minutes. Um, there are a number of other data and data streams that are important in PEPFAR, both in informing program planning and monitoring progress and program and data quality. This includes our PLHIV estimates, uh, above site investment benchmarks, data quality assessments, um, resource alignment and strategic and our SID. Um, and all these data sources are developed internally by PEPFAR or by external stakeholders in coordination with PEPFAR. Next slide, please. USAID also has additional data streams that are agency specific and reported internally. For results reporting, um, in order to better capture results and make timely course corrections to programs and interventions, USAID started collecting high frequency reporting or HFR data starting in June, 2019. This monthly reporting of a subset of seven key MER indicators helps USAID and partners track progress towards targets and use that data to diagnose any issues or gaps and take action to adjust programs accordingly in a timely manner. HFR data is submitted by implementing partners through PEPFAR country teams or USA to country teams using an Excel template. In addition to the increased frequency of MER indicators reported through HFR, USAID recognized a gap in ability to monitor certain programs due to limitations of the MER indicators. In response, um, quarterly monitoring on custom indicators is requested from partners as applicable based on the programs implemented. Custom data is also reported using, a, using an Excel template in similar structure to HFR and also submitted through USAID country teams. Did we lose Christy? Sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> um, had a disconnection for a second. So let me jump back to, um, I'll just cover custom data again. That might've been where we jumped off. Um, so um, custom indicators are re uh, requested on a quarterly basis from partners as applicable based on programs that are implemented. Custom data is also reported using an Excel template in a similar structure to HFR and also submitted through USAID country teams. While reporting is not required, participation has increased since the launch of USAID's custom data collection in FY21Q1 with an increase to 23 operating units having partners submitting data in quarter two. On the operational side, a final important data stream is our budget data. Disbursements are outlays of funds from USAID to implementing partners through advances, letter of credit drawdowns, or payment of invoices are tracked real time in Phoenix, the agency's financial system, and mechanism level obligation and outlay data is reported to SGAC and the interagency semi annually. This information provides tracking of award funding compared with budgets and is also used in annual COP planning. Next slide, please. 
Looking across all of the various data streams, each is key in helping um, address key analytic questions that guide our PEPFAR program planning and implementation. We use EPI data to guide where PEPFAR should work and which population should be prioritized to address gaps in getting to epidemic control. Our various results focused data help describe how PEPFAR is doing in achieving our goals. SIMS data addresses the question, is PEPFAR conducting quality services at the site or community? And the various financial data streams tell how PEPFAR invests and utilizes resources to meet program goals. Next slide. Now we'll turn to some updates and reminders for several of the data streams. Next slide. And starting with our MER data. So each year, SGAC facilitates a MER refresh process to revise and update the MER indicators and guidance, starting with a survey to PEPFAR staff and CSOs and external stakeholders. Based on that input, SGAC leadership decides on any revisions, which are updated for the next fiscal year. For the current refresh, which is MER 2.6, this applies to the implementation in COP21 FY22, which started October 1st. And the first um, reporting cycle in line with these updates will occur for the FY22 Q1 period, which ends December 31st. Accordingly, data, datum, data entry screens um, um, will be updated um, and available in December. By the end of next week, um, November 12th, new indicator training videos for each technical area will be posted to datum Zendesk reflecting the updates to guidance. Next slide. So going into the details of the updates for MER 2.6, two of the bigger shifts are the retirement of the PREP CUR indicator and introduction of a new PREP CT indicator. PREP CT essentially replaces PREP CUR, but is focused on PREP continuation. PREP CT will reflect the number of individuals, not including those newly enrolled um, in the reporting period, who return for a follow-up visit or reinitiation visit for PREP which includes both oral and non-oral PrEP regimens. Um, the disaggregates for this indicator include test results, key population, and pregnant breastfeeding. PrEP CT is not intended to be analyzed in a trend with PrEP CUR, um, as it is a different indicator. And unlike PrEP CUR, it is not a cumulative indicator. Um, it also reports on a quarterly basis separate individuals from PrEP new. A second, um, MER 2.6 update is the decreasing frequency of reporting for TBART from quarterly to annual. Next slide. The rest of the updates in this refresh are all related to disaggregate changes. You can see an overview here of the indicators grouped by technical area, um, but we'll walk through each of these changes over the next few slides. So next slide. The most notable of the disaggregate updates is the expansion of the 50 plus age band for TX CUR into finer age bands. This expansion of the finer age bands was added in recognition of the changing population dynamics. Globally, 20% of our TX CUR data is reported in the 50 plus age band, making it proportionally the largest age band. In order to get better visibility into our PLHIV and treatment populations, the five-year age bands will be expanded up to 60 to 64, then 65 plus. However, for FY22, a 50 plus age band option will be available when reporting for these finer age bands is not yet possible, but the intent is that all reporting will shift to the finer age bands in the future. Next slide. Um, we already covered the PrEP CT and PrEP CUR details, so we'll move on to the next one. For HTSTST, a new modality, social network strategy or SNS testing has been added as a separate testing modality, which can be reported as either facility or community. This modality was added because SNS testing is a key case finding approach for KP programs. As with other testing modalities, SNS testing will be disaggregated by age, sex, and test results with KP continuing as a standalone disaggregate. Next slide. OVC HIV stat has disaggregates for status type, which includes three different options for reported HIV positive, reported HIV negative, or tests not required. In MER 2.6, 
these groups will be further disaggregated into pediatric age sex bands. This will facilitate comparison to TX Cur for monitoring of enrollment of children who are in, AB, who are in OBC programs on the treatment. Next slide. For AGY Prev, the most significant update is the addition of comprehensive economic strengthening as an additional disaggregate under service type in the denominator. This addition is to align with the COP and DREAMS guidance, which emphasizes this type of evidence-based programming for AGYW. Next slide. Under HTS index, for the contacts tested disaggregate, an additional disaggregate for documented negative will be added for pediatric age sex bands only. This will facilitate analysis of index testing cascade for pediatrics and comparing contacts elicited for contacts tested in those pediatric age bands. Next slide. For HTS recent, there are several changes to, this, to the disaggregates. The confirmed reader results will be further disaggregated by testing modality. The, con the term confirmatory is removed from the indicator definition and language is aligned with the standard protocols for RTRI recent long-term and RITA recent long-term. Additionally, in alignment with the changes to HTS-TST, SNS testing will also be added as a testing modality. Next slide. For TXRTT, return to treatment, disaggregates are added for interruption in treatment to reflect how long patients were off ARBs and which sites are successful at returning patients to treatment within shorter timeframes. The interruption and treatment disaggregates are set for less than three months, three to six months, and six plus months. Next slide. Similarly for TXML, disaggregate changes are related to IT, IIT, interruption and treatment. In this case, as the majority of TXML IIT data is currently being reported as three plus months, and with the expansion of MMD, this, this trend may increase. So further, um, the indicators disaggregate is further split um, into three to six months and six plus months to provide more insight on timing. Next slide. For the treatment indicators, TXCUR and TXNEW, partners will have the option of including a disaggregate for focused population. This is separate from key population disaggregates and will not be further disaggregated by age sex. Um, again, this is an optional disaggregate, um, should reflect a historically underserved population, um, but only one focus population can be used per each operating unit. So this should be reported in consultation with PEPFAR teams. Next slide. The final MER 2.6 change is in the supply chain indicators, adding the two noted pediatric regimens to the list of disaggregates, allowing for monitoring of rollout of optimized pediatric regimens. And next slide. Shifting now to um, from our Pet Farmer reporting to the USAID custom indicators reporting, there are several updates for FY22 as well. The first set of updates are adjustments to indicators, age bands, and disaggregates, just in alignment with the MER 2.6 updates that we just covered. Additionally, two of the indicators have been renamed as noted on the slide, but there are no changes to the definitions or disaggregates for those indicators, just the names only. The next update is a request that mission teams were asked to provide validation list of of expected PSNU by IM by indicator reporting. Since custom indicator reporting is not required reporting, the team in OHA does not have clear visibility on which partners or PSNUs are expected to report these custom indicators. So mission teams are verifying in coordination with partners, which partners are expected to report, um, which will help us review um, data completeness as this data comes in. There are also several clarifications and modifications to indicators and disaggregates and updates to the data collection guidance. Links to all of the guidance documents are provided. Next slide. Looking at our progress on SIMS and efforts for quality assurance and improvement, COVID has limited the ability to continue SIMS visits in the traditional formats, which require in-person visits. However, in spite of these limitations, USAID and our partners in collaboration have continued quality assurance and quality improvements efforts. 
While only one third of SIMS visits that were planned were actually completed in FY21, most country teams have applied a variety of alternative approaches to ensure program quality. This includes a variety of virtual or hybrid monitoring and engagement opportunities. Based on a mission, um, a survey to mission teams where um, SIMS was not possible, um, they reported approaches such as teleconferencing and electronic surveys um, were used or implemented um, as frequently as weekly. And um, these variety of methods were used to continue to ensure data and program quality. Top challenges that were identified through the QI process included HIV testing, linkage to treatment services, and viral load access and monitoring. These were common themes identified through both SIMS and alternative approaches. Um, and to address these kinds of challenges, mission teams and partners have used continuous quality improvement or CQI methods such as plan, do, study, act. Next slide. There are several updates related to this data stream. The focus is shifting for SIMS to incorporate and align SIMS with the PEPFAR minimum program requirements or MPR and CQI. Initial planning is underway for an update to SIMS and the next iteration, the SIMS 4.2 tool will be released next October. The COP22 guidance and next update to SIMS will include updated guidance related to COVID-19 with CEE specific for virtual application. Completing a comprehensive SIMS assessment virtually does still require at least one USG staff member to be on site. Um, we do encourage staff to use the SIMS tool for self-assessments. Um, there is no requirement to report results of self-assessments, so they can be a very useful tool for internal quality checks and program improvement. On the right side of this slide, you can see an example of how continuous quality improvement was used in Uganda to improve program outcomes. Through FY21 Q1, index testing for pediatric and adolescent clients was below targets, leaving a gap in the number of children of PLHIV and siblings of children and adolescents living with HIV with known HIV status. A client audit tool was used to address this gap through a three-phased approach starting in Q1. As a result, index testing among target populations increased five-fold compared to baseline, significantly increasing the proportion of children and siblings with known HIV status. This demonstrates that refining approaches and using quality improvement methods and tools can improve program results. Next slide. Specific to local partners and data and reporting needs, through DataFi, our LP, part, our LP PEPFAR SI Capacity Self-Assessment Tool, or SICA tool, is available to help identify specific SI and data realms where local partners need additional support. SICA has four domains and 12 subdomains as listed on the, the graphic, and self-assessment is completed by the local partner with an assessment also done by um, USAID mission staff, usually an AOCOR or activity manager. Once the online questionnaire is complete by both partner and ACOR, scores are given and can serve as a discussion point for devising a plan for any needed capacity building. In response to the assessment results from an initial use of the tool with eight local partners, as shown on the slide, several key area, key domains were identified across partners where there were opportunities for capacity building. And in response, um, we developed a course on OHA approaches and tools for QAQI, which has already been completed by 230 participants from 89 local partners representing 24 different countries. Both the SICA tool and the course are available in both English and French, and the course is a self-paced training open to anyone. Um, we recommend partners take advantage of the SICA tool to self-assess and get a sense of where they may need support and capacity development. As more partners use the tool and other domains are identified where there are common needs, we may be able to develop additional resources or courses to help address any gaps identified. Next slide. Shifting back to one of our other key routine reporting requirements, expenditure reporting. A few reminders as partners who implemented during FY21 are finalizing their annual submissions. The initial data entry upload deadline is November 5th, this Friday, um, allowing time for preliminary ACOR and USAID review 
and any necessary revisions prior to the final deadline and data entry close date of November 12th next week. As a few reminders, reporting guidance and guidance for using the Datum platform for data submission can be found on the Datum Zen Desk, which is linked in the slides. For our Africa-based local partner colleagues, please do continue to utilize the ASAP technical assistance consultants to help with pre-submission reviews and to troubleshoot any last issues. Another good resource to review is the USAID additive reporting guidance, which was circulated through missions and TA providers. And please don't forget to both upload and submit, which is two separate steps in datum. And we always recommend trying to do so early in case there are any technical issues with the platform. In addition to your TA provider, you can also always reach out to our headquarters team with questions and concerns, and we can be reached at the email address listed, oha.ea.usa at usaid.gov. Next slide. I also want to re-emphasize the importance of reporting high quality expenditure data as ER data along with other data sources is used to inform COP planning and decision making. Please do continue to engage with your USAID ACOR or other point of contact as you're finalizing submissions to ensure they meet standards across the quality dimensions. Timeliness, submitting by deadlines outlined in the PEP4 data calendar, again with initial submission this Friday and final submission by November 12th. Validity, during data entry and upon initial download and upload into datum, make sure to check and address any validation checks that are flagged. Completeness, report all eligible expenditures for the COP20 FY21 implementation period. For accuracy, reporting every dollar as it was spent, even if there are variations from the original plan budget. It really does help inform our future planning to understand how resources were actually used. But do communicate with your ACOR or activity manager if you had significant deviations from the budget, just so they can better understand the context and reasons and are able to address any questions. And finally, we do want to ensure the reliability of our data by adhering to the PEPFAR guidance and USAID recommendations for reporting. Next slide. While we are just finishing FY21 reporting, FY22 or COP21 implementation has started, and there are some ways to be planning now for next year's reporting. Notably, we anticipate one key change to the PEPFAR guidance for ER reporting for FY22. That's the expansion of subrecipient expenditure reporting. For now, and in this year's reporting, prime partner expenditures are reported by program area and beneficiary, that intervention grouping, and further disaggregated by cost category. Subrecipient expenditures are only reported by intervention, the program area and beneficiary, with one reporting template submitted per prime implementing partner per mechanism. Starting next year, we ant anticipate that SGAC will require full disaggregation of subrecipient expenditures by cost category as well. This will mean the prime partner will submit a completed ER template for the prime partner expenditures and one completed template each for each of the subrecipients under the implementing mechanism. There will be more guidance to come, but for now, we do want partners to be aware that this change is coming so you can work with subrecipients to ensure expenditures are tracked appropriately through the coming year. Next slide. Other ways to help prepare for next year, um, we recommend partners ensure all staff at both prime and subpartner levels review and understand ER reporting guidance and are familiar with the reporting requirements, timelines, and best practices. You may also con consider instituting a process to track expenditures according to the PEPFAR financial framework starting at the beginning of the financial year instead of waiting and trying to recategorize things at the end. One approach and related tool for how to track expenditures and allocate staff time and, time and some of the cross-cutting expenditures um, was presented by one of our colleagues from AGPATH on a recent ASAP expenditure reporting webinar. A recording of the webinar along with slides and the tool from, M from AGPATH can be found on the ASAP website. Next slide. Additional recommendations for successful and quality expenditure reporting include using a multidisciplinary approach involving not only the finance and operations staff, but also program or technical and M&E and SI staff to fully ensure complete and accurate reporting. 
across these teams, assumptions for staff time, subrecipient expenditures, and other cross-cutting expenses can be set up front um, and create a framework for capturing expenditures throughout the year. These assumptions can then be reviewed and revised on a periodic basis as needed. Um, open communication with USAID POCs during expenditure reporting is key um, and can facilitate discussion and resolution of any questions or concerns, especially around deviations from planned budgets. And finally, we recommend building on and adapting existing systems and processes to track expenditure data. There's no need to completely rebuild systems or reinvent new processes. We wanna maximize data quality, but without placing additional undue burden on partners for reporting and tracking. Next slide. So with that, I'll turn it over to Sarah to cover the HRH reporting, but I'll be happy to answer any questions in the chat or when we get to the Q&A section. Thanks. Great, hello everyone. Uh, next slide. So the HRH inventory reporting is here. Um, so this is the first year that it's being done and it is an annual Q4 reporting requirement. And this slide here shows a variety of resources available. So on the left side there, you can see resources available from OGAC. So these are all available at datum.zendesk.com. Under the PEPFAR guidance section, you will find an HRH section with HRH guidance. And under the datum trainings and tutorials section, you will also find an HRH section that gives guidance on how to upload data for, um, for HRH inventory. I specifically wanted to highlight that link down at the bottom, which is OGAX guidance for IP users, filling out the template datum submissions and error resolution. It's a very useful document that goes over a lot of the issues that folks might be running into when trying to upload their HRH data into datum. On the right side there are a list of uh, USAID resources. So USAID uh, gave uh, multiple trainings. So you can see three of them listed out there. And we are releasing a uh, bi-weekly frequently asked questions. The next one will come out next week. And if you need any copies of slides, please contact your HRH mission POC. Next slide, please. So here you can see the timeline. So this matches all other uh, Q4 uh, timelines. You can see listed out there the presentations that were given, um, and you can see the red box there is around November 5th, which is the Q4 data submission deadline, which is this Friday, and then the final deadline of November 12th, which is when the approval must be completed. Next slide. So as a reminder, within the template, there are a few key key things we'd like to highlight. So one is please do not use a record number field in the HRH inventory template. So the template is an Excel-based tool and the very first column is record number. And as, a, as USA headquarters, we recommend not using this field. Um, so it is an optional field and under no circumstances should PII be entered into this field. Next slide. Another update is on reporting non-monetary compensation. So there's been, update, there's been an update to what qualifies as non-monetary compensation. And this chart is also located within the frequently asked questions. Um, so you can see that non-monetary compensation includes anything purchased for the purpose of incentivizing work. Non-monetary does not include supplies or other resources required for fulfilling jobs. So you can see here what is with the green check as qualifying versus the red X as not qualifying for non-monetary compensation. And as a note, all non-monetary compensation should be reported in the annual PEPFAR fringe expenditure column. Next slide. So in addition to the previous slide, there's been um, some clarity on how to report staff that are receiving only non-monetary compensation. So in this case, um, there are IPs, um, in a case where IPs are working with volunteers that only receive non-monetary related expenses that fall outside of the non-monetary qualifications, um, these staff must still be entered into the template, but their expenditure should be listed as zero. So to clarify, we have a chart here. So the first uh, scenario there is a non-monetary uh, worker who receives um, items for personal use. So that's a qualifying non-monetary um, amount as seen by the previous slide. So in mode of hiring, you would choose non-monetary only. For sum of annual PEPFAR expenditure, you would leave that section blank because there is no expenditure. And then in the annual PEPFAR fringe expenditure, you would enter in that non-monetary compensation estimate. The second line there is the example of a non-monetary only worker who receives supplies or other resources required for fulfilling job duties. So again, that's a non-qualifying non-monetary estimate. So again, you still need to enter these staff into the template. You're gonna enter them as non-monetary only. 
you're going to enter nothing for their sum of annual PEPFAR expenditure, and then you're going to enter zero dollars for their PEPFAR fringe expenditure. Again, because their um, non-monetary compensation is not qualifying, but we still do want to capture those stats. Next slide. So after you've completed the template, uh, you will need to access the HRH datum system. So if you have not done so already, you must request an HRH datum account at register.datum.org. This is different than an ER account or a MER account. So even if you already have a datum account, you do still need to register. So you can see this diagram on the left, which is an example of how you, might, how you can register for a datum account. If you need help with datum or need to change any permissions, you need to submit an, a, a datum Zendesk ticket. There's a link there. And in the drop down for the ticket, there is an option for HRH. So you can click on that and then write to the datum help desk about uh, what issue you're having or what changes you need to have done. So within the datum, uh, with, within datum, once you're get granted access, there are two apps. So one is the HRH processor app, which is that blue um, sort of grid looking uh, piece there. And the other one is the data approval app, which is the big green check. If you're used to ER reporting, this is very similar, um, but again, it's HRH, not ER. So within the HRH processor app, you'll be able to download your OU specific template. You will then be able to upload your completed template and you will be able to check for template errors. Once you have an error, Sarah, for yes. sorry, sorry, just to um, just to ask and getting a, a, a question from our interpreter, uh, if you can just speak slowly so the interpreter has sure. time to um, <laughs> to translate. Sure. Um, so to review about Datum, there are two apps. So one is the HRH processor app and the other is the data approval app. So within the HRH processor app, which again is that blue grid on the right there, you will be able to download your OU specific template. You will be able to upload your completed template and you will be able to check for template errors. That is the only place you'll be able to check for the errors. The errors will not be checked within the template itself. So once you have submitted your error-free template into the HRH processor app, you will then need to submit the data in the data approval app. This is the same as what is done for ER. Next slide. So another issue that's come up multiple times for partners is extending the Excel-based template. So again, you receive this Excel-based template from the HRH processor app, and it, is, um, it has two tabs, and it's where you enter all the data about your staff. So what we have found is that for most templates after row 51, the templates no longer contain the dropdown options, meaning it's difficult to enter in the staff because there's no dropdown options. So the, way, the best way to fix this is to highlight starting at record number all the way down to the comment section. So highlight the entire row. And then in the bottom right corner, you should be able to click and drag down and you'll be able to populate as many rows as you need with the drop-down information. If you only drop, if you only drag down one column at a time, you may run into issues because there are hidden columns within the template that are leading to validations. So particularly in the datum hierarchy section, folks are having difficulty. So make sure you highlight from column A all the way down to the comment section and drag down everything at once. So that way you are able to extend the template. There's also guidance uh, on the link there on page 13 on HRH instructions for IP users. Next slide. So as a reminder, all of the template errors only appear when you upload into Datum. And again, that's the Datum HRH processor app, that blue Excel looking um, tab. So if your template is uploaded successfully with no errors, you will see that top image there, which has a green check for success. If there are any errors in your template, you will see this exclamation point and the sign for the errors. If you click on that exclamation point, you will see what these errors are and you'll be able to correct them. So some recommendations are to upload your template often and early to check for errors. Again, you will not see any errors in the Excel-based template, only when you upload into Datum. You can upload the template as many times as you need to. You can even upload a partially completed template just to check for those errors. 
In the end, you must delete all of the error-ridden templates and upload one final error-free template. <laughs> and there again is OGAC's guidance, which has a link there um, for how to correct errors that you are seeing in Datum. Next slide. So as we get this data for Q4 um, and for subsequent years, we're thinking about ways to advance the utilization of the new HRH inventory data for continued COP implementation and planning. So here are a few high-level recommendations for how to use this data moving forward. So you recommend to review as use it as a review of current staffing composition and distribution and alignment to targets and target achievement. So aligning the HRH inventory to uh, MER targets can be a powerful way to look at this data. We recommend reviewing the staffing models being used to support program activities. So you'll be able to take a look at which types of staff are supporting certain programs um, and also their, um, their LOE and, and the style in which those staff are being hired and whether or not they're salaried or contract, et cetera. And finally, how has staffing uh, been more optimally utilized through COVID-19 adaptations? And what are anticipated staffing needs in the year ahead taking account taking account of these lessons. So again, there is a question about COVID-19, so you'll be able to see which staff were um, allocated to COVID-19 and be able to make uh, more um, investigations there. Next slide. So if you have any questions about the training content, please submit your question to HRH Reporting Help Desk at USAID.gov. That's my office at USAID headquarters. Um, all OU and mechanism specific questions should be directed to your ACOR and or your HRH mission point of contact. And if you are having issues with datum, please submit a datum help desk ticket. There's a link there. Again, there's an option to drop down for an HRH specific issue. So please check that and then type to them the issue that you're having. Again, USAID headquarters cannot make any adjustments in datum and cannot fix any issues with templates in datum only the datum help desk can do that. So please make sure you're submitting tickets. And so I believe that is it. So I'm happy to take any questions. Um, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sarah and Christy. Um, we do have a couple questions that have come in and I encourage um, folks here to, to go ahead and either put your questions in the chat or I'm also happy uh, for folks to come off mute and ask directly but maybe just to get, get started, um, one of the first questions that came in was, is it possible for OHA or other offices to put all the tools for the different reporting um, instructions in a single pack? This will make it easier for partners to access in case of updates and old versions can be removed. Um, so Christy or Sarah, can you talk about where uh, our partners can find these tools um, and access what they need to know for reporting. Sure, I can I can start. So for um, for the PEPFAR wide tools, we don't have a lot of direct control about how those are stored, but they are actually all fairly centrally located. The guidance documents and templates where relevant for the different data streams. Um, that are PEPFAR wide um, are located on the, the datum Zend desk. This includes MER and SIMS and ER and HRH. Um, and uh, for the USAID specific reporting, so for our HFR and custom data reporting, we can work to find a more central location to put those things together that's accessible to partners. Right now we're relying partly on missions to circulate. Um, and um, we do have a, a site that has at least the each of those separately, but we can work to um, to streamline that a little bit further. Thanks for the suggestion. And Sarah, anything on the HRH tools to add? Sure, so um, within the PEPFAR guidance or within the datum um, tools, once you click on that, then each piece is segmented out as Christy was saying. So um, I think I, I put direct links on that slide just because I was speaking about HRH, but when you come to that, you'll see MER and then you'll see HRH. And so underneath the HRH heading then are all of the tools that are used for HRH. And I would just note too that there's um, for at least the the MER and ER and all the the data um, streams that have been um, around for a few years longer. The prior versions for the MER guidance, for example, the 2.6 is available as well as 2.5 and 4 and prior iterations. So you can look back as for reference on changes. Um, but the latest version is usually the 
the first thing that, that pops up in each of those sections. Okay, thank you, Christy, Sarah. And if there's any um, links relevant for partners to have, maybe we can put those directly in the chat. Um, we have a couple more questions, several questions on the HRH tool. Um, uh, so a question from iCare in Uganda. Um, is the, the HRH cool tool, is it possible to include options for OVC community structures? And uh, Fulukas, if you're, if you're on the line and want to elaborate on this, please feel free to come off mute and ask your question directly. Hi everyone, Fulukas from Uganda here. Um, I'm the chief of party for eye care program in Uganda. Um, I've looked at the HR um, tool. Uh, it is more of a clinical tool. We have a community structure that make very, very significant contribution in terms of money hours to achieving uh, OVC results. But however, it is usually sometimes very, very difficult for us to, to kind of categorize and input them in the HR, um, HRS tool. Is there a way of either kind of redefining the existing to include them or to create an option for them? Over. Sure. And is the issue mainly with the employment title? Is it that there isn't an employment title that matches those staff or is the issue with program area? I think it's both actually. Um, um, it's both because um, in terms of employment title, you realize that uh, you may have a similar structure under a clinical uh, program, but it's all, there is also a similar one under an OVC program, but because the clinical one is the one that is included there and the one for OVC is not, all what we always do when we are actually computing the, the tool, we actually add the OVC on the clinic one. Okay, so the employment titles are, you know, everything is set for this year, but certainly adjustments can be made in, in subsequent years. But all of the employment titles are categorized under sub cost categories as defined by ER. So certain employment titles are under healthcare worker clinical, certain employment titles are under ancillary, and then others under program management and other staff. Um, so that's the way that's broken down. But maybe we can take a look at how, what you're saying is that there's employment titles that are under HCW clinical, but that those staff could be considered OBC. Is that what you're saying? Correct. Okay, yeah, so we could definitely take a look at that. You know, for this year, we won't be able to make any adjustments. Um, the advice for how to choose staff is to choose the employment title that best reflects that staff member. So in terms of reporting this year, um, choose the employment title that best reflects your staff member is the advice. Um, but certainly we can take a look at that for uh, next year. And then in terms of program area, the program areas are also matched to ER. So they follow the same, um, the same titles, but we can take a look at perhaps some of the sub program areas and see if there are any there that we might be able to pull into the HRH inventory for a future iteration. Thank you. Sure. Th thank you, Sarah and Christy. We, we've got a number of questions here sort of related um, to uploading data into Datum. Um, so I'll just sort of quickly read through some of them. So during upload, if it shows a warning, what are the next steps? Is it possible to approve? Um, an another question from, um, you, you need to, after uploading to datum, the template is lost. After some time, what is the reason? Um, from CASA at ADA, HRH reporting has disappeared after approval. Can, can it appear in the system? And then the last one, similar to this, we are now, from Helena, we are now uploading the HRH report into datum. Uh, from noon until now, it up the upload is not su successful, and we have received an error. What could be the problem? So I think these are sort of um, several part. Many partners are sort of struggling with this. Wonder if you all have recommendations for actually uploading the data into Datum. Yes. Um, so we do. We have had 
many partners um, letting us know that these issues are appearing. Um, and unfortunately, I am not able to control and my office is not able to control anything within Datum. Um, so the best advice is to submit a Datum help desk ticket. So I did send the link to everyone there. And within that ticket, you can drop down to um, HRH and then tell them your specific problem. Um, as far as I know, submissions are being registered. So when it disappears, I do think that it is still, it still has been submitted, but please do still submit the ticket so that way they are aware of the problem. Um, and as for the errors, which is a little bit different, um, you are not able to approve a error-ridden template. So if you have an error, you will need to fix that error before you are able to submit. And there's a slight difference between um, error and warning. So if you do receive a warning, that's okay. You will be able to upload. But if you receive an error, you will not be able to upload. I'm also seeing another question about the template itself, um, which is a question about the, the number of rows. Mm -hmm. So it is one oh, individual. So, sorry. It, can, it, sorry, can I explain here? Sure. Yeah, uh, ours is, as uh, we explained, approval is possible after the uploading on the HRH processor. I just approved, I'm CASA, a chief of party at ADA. Uh, so I approved and it accepted. And in the system, it says uh, submitted by partner. After some time, you see, the uploaded HRH document disappeared from the HRH processor page. That, that, that's difficult, you know? When we entered inside the, 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 the data, there is warning. As you said, warning doesn't matter. And because uh, the approval was okay, because the error was not that much difficult for approval. That's our problem, you see. Thank you. Okay, and were you able to, so it sounds like you were in the HRH processor app. Were you also able to see the template in the uh, data sub submission app or data approval app, the green check? Yeah, in the data submission and approval uh, page, uh, there is one, it says one error. But in the upper page, submitted by partner, it says. And the approval uh, page is approved and submitted. It says approved and submitted to partner, by partner, it says. But after an hour or more than that, when you entered in the HRH processor, we, we didn't found the HRH, the uploaded data. OK. I don't know um, that specific situation, but I think if you can, if you want to send to the HRH help desk, I'll put the um, note, the, the email in the chat here. You can send me what the error is and I can try to work out what the error is. Um, but then for the datum issues of it disappearing, again, unfortunately, I cannot uh, make any adjustments in datum. So please submit a ticket to them. And I want to let you guys know that it's definitely a lot of people that are having this these issues with datum. Um, so certainly, it is not only only us here, um, but please do keep submitting those tickets. And let me add in the, the HRH email to the chat right now. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Casa. We, we also have a question from Green Label, which I believe is in Uganda, um, on um, if, if the reporting requirement applies for VMMC clinical waste and for FAAs. If someone is here from Green Label, do you want to uh, go off mute and ask your question? Please go ahead. Okay, we're, I think you're still on mute. <laughs> it's okay. Um, Christy or Sarah, can either of you answer this, this question from Green Label?
So I know for, for HRH, the advice has been to speak to your ACOR. So we can't give formal guidance on whether or not those people should report. So please speak to your ACOR as the guidance for HRH. Okay, thank you. And Christy, anything to add for all the other data reporting streams? Yeah, I think it similarly um, connecting with ACOR. So FAA um, funded, funded a, awards are still um, under the purview of all of the, the PEPA requirements of expenditure reporting. The guidance um, still holds. There's some caveats we can talk about, but essentially the reporting of expenditures should be in line with the guidance of expenditures as um, as as funds were spent on the cash basis from the the prime, regardless of how the the budgets are done or how the um, the funds are um, are invoiced according to the the set milestones. Thanks, Christy and Sarah. Um, okay, it looks like we have another question that came in from Louise Malua. Uh, in South Africa, they are also receiving an error after uploading the HRH report. So Sarah, maybe this is again, the sort of same answer to submit a ticket or any other guidance you could give uh, to Louise. Sure, if you wanna send the error to us at the HRH reporting help desk at usa.gov, we're happy to take a look at the error and see if we can help um, uh, understand what that error in the template is, but in terms of datum issues like the template disappearing or not able to be uploaded or things like that, that all has to be through the datum help desk. Um, so I, those two links are there. I can put them in again, um, and I'm sorry that there have been so many difficulties with this system. Okay, we have another question on FAAs. Shouldn't ER for FAAs be based on USA disbursements with cost allocations as directed in the initial budget guidance? Yeah, and this is a, a common question we've been getting. Um, and so expenditure reporting really is a, um, a different reporting stream from the, the outlays um, data that, that are in line with how things are, are budgeted and the actual disbursements of funds from USAID. For expenditure reporting, we are reporting on a, a cash basis of accounting from what the, the prime partners have actually spent. We recognize that this is a somewhat unique circumstance where the, the expenditures um, likely won't directly match what we're seeing in the, the outlays or even in the original um, budget, but that that's one of the, the um, the the conversations you should have with your ACOR just to understand um, so they're aware of the where the differences are coming from but the the guidance has been to to follow the expenditure reporting guidance as written and report the actual expenditures for the anything that was um, spent during the fiscal year um, before September 30th. Okay, I just want to, I think we've gone through the chat. Um, we have quite a, a large group here. I wanted to open the floor. Um, if anyone wants to come off mute and ask a, another question or share your experience um, with the PEPFAR reporting requirements, um, please, you're welcome to do so now. While we have our experts here on the line with us. This is Mackenzie. Uh, so for the HRH template, we we have staff that are operating at a, a national level, not at a subnational unit level. Uh, so when we are populating the template, some of the columns for those staff uh, will not necessarily apply to them, but maybe it is only going to apply uh, at the the management level. Uh, is that team going to accept that uh, those columns will remain blank? Over. Sarah, you're on mute. <laughs> Sarah, 
Okay, there we go. Sorry about that. Um, so you must complete all elements in the template. The exceptions are record number, which again, USAID headquarters recommends not completing. So you can certainly leave that first column blank. You can also leave the comments section blank, which is the very last column in the template. And you can also leave the datum hierarchy section, which is like SNU1, PSNU community facility. It's highlighted blue in the template. You can also leave that blank. And actually for national staff, unless you are a regional OU, you're supposed to leave the, the datum hierarchy uh, section blank to indicate that that staff member is working at the OU level. Um, but you do need to fill in something for all of the other elements. So employment title, program area, service delivery, non-service delivery, you will need to enter all of those. And so the advice is to fill you know, with the best um, estimate possible um, uh, for, for those staff that you are completing. Mackenzie, okay, did that you. answer your question? Yeah, exactly, sure. So I think it does answer, because that's why I was struggling for, for instance, a driver working at um, a, a national office uh, who doesn't apply for all the subnational units. Uh, but yes, mm -hmm. we fill in all the other HR information, but then they don't. Okay, I think we lost you, Mackenzie. Um, but I hope that did answer your your question. It looks like we're getting another um, comment in the chat from Karen and Kenya about extending the rows uh, past 2000 in the HRH template. Um, Sarah, I think you addressed this. I don't know if you want to share that sure. again verbally. Mm -hmm. So there are two row issues with the template. So one is what I reviewed in the slides, which is that after row 50, you lose the options for the dropdowns. So again, the best way to repopulate those dropdowns is to highlight from row A all the way down to the comment section and drag down that whole, that whole row until you have as many dropdowns as you need. Another issue is that the, all, most of the templates end after 2,000 rows. Um, which means that you can't, you know, at the moment you can't enter more staff and there are sometimes more staff. So the best way to do that is to highlight the last row 2000 and drag that down as well. Mm -hmm. And again, if you need those drop downs, again, you have to start from row 51 and drag down until you have populated more space for you in that template. Thanks, Sarah. Oh, we have a question uh, from, um, uh, Tedros is it on the PSNU and community aspects. Um, to to Wodros, uh, do you want to come off mute and ask your question here, just so we can better understand your concern? Hello, hello, yeah, yeah. Uh, is that possible not to fill the PSNU community part? So for. Above site staff, yes. For any site level staff, you are going to need to report down to the PSNU. It depends on which program area you choose. Uh, family focused HIV prevention care and treatment service. So those would all be considered site level program areas. Um, so you will need to complete down to the PSNU level in those cases. Are okay, you saying thank that you. Are you saying that those staff don't have a PSNU? Is that the issue? Uh, yeah, there is, there is a CMU. Uh, but when we fill this PSNU community part, uh, it comes era. And when, when we leave uh, that part, <laughs> it comes success. So my understanding is that it's a warning and not an error. And I'm sorry that that's happening. It, it, it's frustrating because we definitely do want to report those site level staff to the PSNU community. So my understanding is that in that situation, it's a warning and it will still allow you to submit the final template um, even though you've, you've, you have that warning there. Okay, okay. Thank you, Sarah. Th thank you to Wodros. Are there other questions from folks on the line um, about these templates, about the reporting requirements, about datum? 
Anything else? Okay, we have yeah. a question in French. <laughs> All right, Helena, go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you, Kale. Can I continue with my questions? Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, as uh, we're mentioning, uh, Theodros and myself, it seems difficult to upload and uh, to approve the HRH uh, reporting. And uh, now it is almost the time of submission is uh, nearly uh, approaching. What will happen if we, will, we couldn't succeed uh, mm -hmm. on November 5? Sure. Um, so the, the upload submission deadline is the 5th, which is Friday, and the final approval deadline is November 12th. So the system will be open until the 12th. So I, if you cannot do it by the 5th, I do recommend still trying um, after that time up until the 12th. Um, as for what will happen and what OGAC will decide if, if templates cannot be uploaded successfully, I don't know, um, but I recommend still trying even after the fifth. And also please submit those datum help desk tickets as a, if nothing else, as a record that you did submit and did try to submit. Um, so that way OGAC can see that and you have a record of that for yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, we have a question from Lillian. Um, about uh, in French uh, on the part of the, the facility um, file for HRH. Lillian, maybe I can ask you to um, ask your question in French and we'll have it translated here in English for those of us that need translation. Lillian, can you, is Lillian still here? Hello. Hello, Lillian. Please. Bonjour à tous. Bonjour. Please go ahead. Je vous reçois faiblement. Je peux la poser ma question? Oui, oui. D'accord. D'accord. Dans le fichier de H que nous avons reçu, il y a un onglet où c'est mis facility. Et on voulait bien comprendre à quoi sert cette partie. Parce qu'il y a certaines localités que nous renseignons et nous ne trouvons pas exactement le centre de santé auquel nous avons affecté la région ou bien la, la structure. Quand je prends par exemple à Sapsu, il y a un personnel qui est logé au siège ici. Et nous devons affecter après ce projet-là à, à un centre. Est-ce que c'est un centre proche de la structure ou bien un centre où nous référons des patients, ou faut forcément mettre le centre qui est affecté à la structure. Oui. Donc, qu'est-ce qu'on fait? Alors, je ne sais pas si ça a été clair euh, la question. Merci à vous, Lillian. No, that was great. And we also had the English translation option uh, as well for those of us who need, need it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Sarah, was that clear to you? Uh, are you able to, to address Lillian's question? Is there an option for English? Is it Yeah, oh, you didn't hear the translation. Okay. No, I only heard French. Oh, sorry. I should have directed everyone to the interpretation services. Uh, so, so I think my understanding of the question uh, was what um, I think Lillian is trying to better understand what needs to what part of the facility uh, in the template is needed for her to 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 complete. Does anyone else um, want to chime in on uh, on that question? Je vais donner l'exemple, par exemple, de l'ONG à Sapsu, au siège. Il y a une équipe qui, est, qui travaille au niveau du siège, à Abidjan. Nous avons des centres de santé, c'est vrai, dans Abidjan, 
Mais dans le siège ici qui est basé à Cocody, nous n'avons pas d'activité, donc pas de centre à, propre à Sapsu, à, Coco, à la Riviera ici à Cocody. Par contre, dans les autres zones de Abobo, nous avons des centres de santé Yopougon. Donc, du coup, ce staff qui est à Bijon, qui est logé, qui travaille au siège à Cocody, à quel centre de santé pourrons-nous affecter ou bien relier ce personnel? OK. OK. Sarah, you heard the translation. Yes, so, so I'm just going to review a few pieces. So one is you want to choose the location where staff's effort is being done. So for example, someone that works in a city capital, they, they sit, their office is there, but their work is on testing in a facility somewhere else you should report them to that facility where the work is being completed, not where they're actually physically sitting. Did that answer the question? Or I'm happy to think more about facilities. And for HQ staff, um, right, th that are not at a site, how do, how do partners report that LOE? So it, it's where their work is being performed. So if they are headquarters staff who are working within that entire SMU one, they should report to the SMU one. If they are working at headquarters, but all of their work is provided to one specific PSNU, they should report that specific PSNU. We want to know where the work is being performed, not where the person is sitting in their office. Okay, thank you, thank you, Sarah. Sure. Um, we've had a few a, a few more questions come in. Um, a question on: Will the HRH reporting process be evaluated for next year based on some of the challenges uh, partners have experienced this year? So USAID fully expects that. Um, of course, OGAC has all the final say on what reporting requirements are, but this template was put together uh, via an interagency group. So we do expect that next year there will be a similar process we will, where we will learn from this year. So please continue to send us um, information about, about problems you're having so we can record those. And USAID is planning to send a survey um, after reporting is completed for folks to give additional feedback that we can then bring to OGAC as well. Thanks, Sarah. There's a question from Charlotte Basira. Is there any QIQA standard plan for non-clinical mechanisms that could be country contextualized? Um, Charlotte, if you're still on, do you want to add anything to that question? Yeah, uh, let me explain. Uh, I would, uh, through the SIMS, so the SIMS and DKA uh, process that we have experienced, we read that the, some of the tools that are being uh, uh, used are really uh, more uh, ad, um, uh, adapted for clinical projects uh, rather than the community. I'm the COP for a no VC project that is community-based. And for example, for recommendation related to uh, putting in place uh, teams, site-based uh, quality improvement uh, a team, uh, community-based, uh, it was like, for us, it was like, it was, it was at, at, um, uh, more more appropriate for clinical, but not very understandable for community based community oriented uh, mechanism. To mean uh, in case uh, there, there are any plan, any standard plan that we we can uh, uh, contextualize. I was asking if we we can have that uh, that tools or that document for us to 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 take. To, uh, to, to learn from it. Christy, is this for you? Okay, go ahead. Yeah, I can I can try to, to answer this. So yeah, most of the, a lot of the SIM CEEs are, are focused on the, the clinical um, cascading and clinical sites. Um, there is a set of um, 
CEEs within the above site assessment tools that are focused on OBC um, and social services. So that would be a good place to start. Um, I believe our team has also done some work um, with DQAs related to OBC programs. Um, that's something we can follow up on and, and provide some resources. I'm not sure I have those on hand, but um, certainly something that, that the team has considered um, uh, as an, a need for community programs as well as just facilities. Thanks, Christy. Are there any partners on the line that have experience with um, DQAs for community programs or want to share anything uh, on Charlotte's question? Okay. Do we have focus here? Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, I, I think this, what Charlotte is talking about goes back to what I said earlier, that um, most of the tools that we use seem to be um, too much into the clinical aspect, but less of OVC. And during the time of uh, completing these tools, you actually realize that there are missing components for OVC, which is community, not clinic. Just like um, Sarah had stated earlier, that for, to complete the HR tool, you must complete it based on where this person works, not where the person sits. So therefore, if where this person works is not in the clinic, the person is working in the community, and the community is not on the tool, how do I complete it? So that's really the question uh, Charlotte is actually raising, and this is what I raised in earlier. Over. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Charlotte and Lucas, for this. Um, Sarah or Christy, any comments or feedback uh, to the partners on this issue? I see there is a, a comment in the, the chat, and I don't know if Stephanie wants to, to come off mute to, to describe this as, um, yeah, I sort of made vague reference to this, but the, thanks for confirming that Achieve is working on a, a community-led monitoring tool for OVC programs. Um, so if, um, if she wants to provide more information on that. Hi, Christy, um, and hi, everyone. Thank you so much. I'm Stephanie Calvis from the Achieve Project, um, which is a global project supporting OVC and DREAMS activities. We have been in the process over the last year of developing a community-led monitoring toolkit, which will include a component that helps to look at the quality of programs um, at the community level. Um, this has been initially sort of soft launched in a recent webinar through the NPI Expand project. Um, we do expect for the toolkit to be finalized and that we will have a more formal launch and rollout of the toolkit in the next month or so. We're working on some details to get that ready. So please stay tuned. That will be coming out from our program um, and we will make sure it's shared um, across USAID and PEPFAR partners. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Uh, yeah, can I add, uh, can I add some uh, more parts of my question? Please, uh, I think from, yeah, yeah. I take uh, from the intervention from Stephanie. Uh, I think my intervention was uh, a little bit different from the community-led monitoring toolkit. Uh, it is uh, for our DQA, for our DQA internal DQA assessment, which is here. I see the community-led monitoring toolkit is a. Uh, uh, a, a, a tool that will be uh, used, that will, uh, will be serve as a guidance for the community uh, to evaluate, to assess the quality of service that are being offered, uh, which is a little bit different uh, from what I was asking as question. So uh, I, I'm, uh, my question is, is more focused on the tools that are, be, are being used for DKA. Uh, when we are assessing, we are assessing the quality of our, uh, our data, the quality of our service that are being offered through OVC, community-based OVC programs. If we can, uh, 
yeah, if we can have uh, some more, more community oriented tools uh, in which we can uh, uh, find uh, some intervention, uh, community or intervention oriented uh, place where we can, uh, we can find place to place uh, intervention that are being uh, implemented. Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you. No, I think this is a really important point. Um, I'm not sure if we have anyone else on the line from our um, SI division. Christy, do you see anyone here who could address better? Address um, I can just concerns? jump in quickly. Um, the measure evaluation tools for DQAs um, are still a valid option. Um, community programs and um, facility programs um, still use those. So, um, and I'm not sure if Anna is on the line and wants to come off mute to, to clarify further, but um, yeah, we do have a suite of tools for measure evaluation that, that should still be um, viable for use with community programs. Thanks, Christy and Kelly. Hi, everyone. This is Anna Scholl. So, oh, good. Um, Thanks, Anna. Yes. Yeah, so I will just kind of add that uh, our OVC colleagues in HQ actually are finalizing a protocol for specifically for PEFAR OVC. Uh, indicator DQAs, um, and I assume that will be coming out soon. We are working with them to support that effort uh, and roll it out. In the meantime, as, as Christy mentioned, measure evaluation has on their side, if you, to, if you type measure evaluation DQA, has generic tools that are really great and used widely by the Global Fund and WHO and so forth. Um, and are easy customizable to the indicator that is at hand that you want to actually do assessment for. So I, I warmly recommend, um, while we are still awaiting for the specific protocol for OVC indicators, um, to go online and look for measure evaluation um, tools. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Anna. I'm glad you were on the line to chime in. Okay, looks like we have a hand up from Humble. No. Uh, normal, normal. Uh, humble, please go ahead. Hi, 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 colleagues, and th thank you, thank you, Kelly. Um, so, so I just wanted to add in that, uh, first of all, I'm from uh, World Vision Switzerland. Uh, we are implementing a, a USAID project. Uh, it's a OVC dreams project. So I, I thought I, I wanted to come in on the issue of adapting measure evaluation tools. Uh, we've tried out an RDQA and we adapted one. And I think it was fairly adaptable. It, it would be just maybe to chime in and say, uh, some of the tools that exist, especially the measure evaluation tools are tools that are adaptable in the OVC program. However, you, you do note that for the most part, the tools that we have uh, are, are, mostly, are mostly aligned to clinical programs. And I think anything that would be specific to the OVC program will be very much welcome uh, because I think we need something that really speaks to the OVC programs moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Humboldt. And, and this seems to be a common theme we're hearing. So we'll, we'll um, uh, take this back to our OVC team and others that are not on the call and um, share the feedback with them as well. And perhaps they may also have um, tools or recommendations to um, share with partners after this meeting. Um, so really appreciate uh, folks raising this issue. Um, I'm scanning the chat here. Are there are there any other uh, questions that folks want to raise? And just keeping mindful of time, uh, we we will need to close the session in about five minutes or less. But any final questions anyone wants to to raise? Hello. I please go ahead. I'm just trying to identify who's speaking. Oh, is that Helena? This is yes. This is Helena Haole from Tanzania Deloitte. So, uh, my question is on the on, on the expansion of the 50 plus age for the TX car. 
Uh, so my question is, uh, does uh, USA Tanzania has a plan to speak with the government of Tanzania? Because our, our monitoring tools does not uh, capture uh, those uh, finer edge disaggregates. So uh, as, as, as the SI team, we are struggling a lot to do the manual counting of those, of those uh, final edge disaggregates. So adding the 50 plus edge for the text car, also to, it, it, it could add um, uh, another work for the SI team to go to do the manual counting for those edge band. So as the USA Tanzania has a plan to speak with the, uh, with the government of Tanzania so that, so that they, can re, they can revise their, uh, their current uh, data collection tools and reporting tools. Thank you. Thanks for that question. And I can't speak for the USA Tanzania team directly, but um, this is new guidance that just rolled out. Um, and as I noted for the, the FY22 year, at least, there will be the option to still report as 50 plus um, in this interim time. I think we recognize that, that systems and, and tools um, can't be updated overnight. Um, so that gives time for those conversations to happen. So I think globally, each of our country programs where the the government tools and the partners that we work with where all of the tools are not currently in that state to capture that level of detail. Um, we'll be spending time working towards that goal. Um, but in the meantime, again, not wanting to add undue burden where it's just not feasible to break it down. Um, there will still be the option to report aggregated for the time being, but again, with the intent to move to that finer age band as soon as it is possible. Thank you, Christy. And there was another question in the chat from Humble, and this might have to be our last question. Yes, please go ahead, Humble. All right, th th thanks, Kali. Um, now that I have the floor, I had actually two questions that I had in the inbox. So may maybe the first one is, any plans to move the paper custom indicators to date him? I think the different templates can sometimes confuse the, during reporting. And maybe the second question is, there's a SICA tool, the PSI, um, the, the, the SI assessment tool. Uh, do we do it internally or it's reserved for the USAID mission? Or can we invite the USAID mission to conduct that assessment within our program? We have just primed. So I think in strengthening our the the, the M &E systems, I think it's uh, we need such assessment to make sure we are stronger. Thanks. I can answer both questions really quickly. So for the um, the custom indicators at this point, those are um, separate and distinct for USAID collection only. Um, so those will not be incorporated at this time into datum since that is a PEPFAR wide system and those custom indicators are ones that USAID has has defined recognizing some gaps in the the MER reporting based on what we feel is is important to continue to track and monitor um, some of them are things that we have suggested in the annual MER refresh guidance to be um, considered for expansion so perhaps in the future some of those will be added to routine guidance but at this point it is a separate collection outside of data unfortunately and for the SICA tool yes you can um, access it it is available for partners and it would be great to talk with your USAID mission as well to do it as a um, as a collaborative effort of both the self-assessment and the USAID mission side assessment but the the tool is available um, and open in English and French, and um, we can get that resource linked as well. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. And I'm sorry, that's going to have to be our last question because we need to let our interpreters and facilitators go to our next session. Um, so thank you for joining us today. And um, we are we have been taking notes, and we we've recorded your questions, and um, appreciate uh, you joining us here. I um, encourage you to attend um, the next session, uh, technical, a set of technical panels, and then um, today at 11.10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, so later afternoon in, in Africa, um, we will have a live Q&A with our administrator, Power, um, so certainly encourage you to tune in for that. And thank you, Sarah and Christy, so much for uh, the presentations and the responses today. Thank you. Thank you. Merci, au revoir.
Thank you. Thank you, Kale.